Hey YouTube, Skipper T here. Uh, I get a couple of questions on what my fire kit is that I personally carry, and I've gotten several questions on the bird's nest and the basics on building a fire. So I thought I'd go over that with us here today. Um, obviously, I carry a pair of gloves. I carry a large belt. Got this on Amazon. Uh, it's a medieval type belt. It's long enough to go around me and tie itself off and still leave about that much left over. It's rough, you know, um, split suede on the inside, which is nice because now you can use this as a, as a way to hone your blade after you've got it good and sharpened. Always try to keep a leather belt that's got the rough inside on it. On board with this, I carry the Habilis Bush Tool. Uh, I've had this for about six months now. My wife got this for me for my birthday. Um, it is an absolutely wonderful tool. Um, you can kind of see where I've used it there, kind of getting some of the bluing worn off of it there. This thing is heavy. It is solid. It's 3 16 inch, 1095 carbon steel. Absolutely perfect for striking a ferrocium rod, for doing a little chopping, for splitting. It's solid enough that I can use a baton and it's designed that with this divot right here so that you can baton it down through a piece of wood. Um, I never go anywhere without this. I also carry the uh, K-Bar pilot's knife, six inch pilot's knife that I've had for since 1980, 34 years or so. And um, I still carry that with me everywhere as well. But this is my primary go-to, you know, if I've got to take one tool into the woods with me, it's gonna be this dude. Uh, I opted out for the traditional leather um, sheath for it. I've also got a ferrocium rod to tuck in here. I've got a uh, sail needle on the inside of it. It is set up though with this extra strapping on the outside so that you can put it through your belt and carry it scout style if you wanted to, which means it would sit horizontally on your belt versus with the dangler. I personally like the dangler because I like it to to move around and that way the handle always kicks out where I can grab it easily. You've seen the items I've carried in this little pouch before. Um, I have switched over and I'm carrying a different pouch instead of the military surplus green canvas one. I sewed together a little leather pouch here just because, well, I could. So, um, had a lot of fun with that. I have my flint and steel that I got from the Pathfinder School. Uh, Wilderness Outfitters is the YouTube channel. I never leave home without this. This is my favorite, absolute favorite way um, to start a fire. And in fact, when we do the bird's nest today, I'll use this in a piece of char cloth to get that started. I do also carry the Altoids tin. I have char cloth in here. I've got some dryer lint. I've got a lamp wick. You know, everything that you would need to start a fire um, in this tin. These are Vaseline soaked cotton balls. Uh, each one of these would burn for anywhere. Well, these are actually soaked in liquid Vaseline. So each one of these would burn for about 10 minutes. Um, I keep about 10 of them in here just because that was my first rendition of the process. But again, never leave home without it. And I've got a spare ferrocium rod here as well. This one's got a small handle on it. Came with the striker plate that's, that's on it. It's about 3 16 in diameter. It's about two and a half, three inches long. And man, I tell you what, this thing will throw 2,000, 3,000 degree sparks all day long. Again, just another item that I never leave home without. We'll put all this back in. Um, I've gotten some wood over here. Uh, it's to the right of me. Get that stuff back down inside there. Actually, we're gonna need that in the fire steel. But anyway, this is my fire kit, again. I never leave home without it. Anytime I'm out in the woods, out in the backyard, basically, I've always got this with me. I can start a fire anytime, anywhere with everything that's in this particular kit. So we'll take our, well, we've got our Altoids tin. We've got our flint and steel handy. I'll pan over here and show you some of the, the wood that we've got. Now over here, I've got just a small pile of wood. Um, this just came off of the tree in our backyard. Tends to shed all the time. On the left there, we've got a pile of grass. And what I do during the summer 
is I watched the people cut the cut and uh, mow the ditches, and when I see that it's dried, I stop and fill the back of my truck up with it, and then I keep it available in my outbuilding in my garage, so that I've always got a way for to have dry tinder that's out here in the world with it. Today, we're gonna use a piece of jute twine as well. I'm gonna pull this apart, tease it all out, and I'll put it in the center of the bird's nest to help with the char cloth to catch everything on fire. The other big thing we've got to do is we've got to be able to take this wood and process it down to where we can get it to burn. Sounds like a simple process, but nonetheless, it does take a little bit and it takes a little practice um, to get this squared away. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to make three piles. One pile is going to consist of pieces of wood about this size. They're roughly smaller, um, slightly smaller than a pencil. Those are a little short. Um, I want to keep these things about a foot long or so. Um, the reason we're going to do that is because we're going to stack them up. If we start to get some bigger pieces, I'm going to put basically a second and third pile together because I want some stuff that's definitely the size of a pencil um, to add to the fire as it gets started. Now why am I looking at this smaller stuff over here? Um, because we need something that's very small, will collect heat readily and catch on fire. A small piece like this will heat up and combust a lot quicker than a piece of this size. This size piece, you know, this is bigger than my thumb. Um, it's about half the size, well, maybe a quarter of the size of my wrist. So this would take a lot of effort to get this to actually catch on fire. So we start with very small stuff. We go with some intermediate type wood, which are, you know, pieces kind of like this one right here. We'll break that off. Again, these are, you know, number two pencil, maybe a little bit bigger than a number two pencil in size. We'll take the smaller pieces, we'll put a couple over here, put this, and all I'm doing is just breaking off the smaller stuff right off of these limbs here. And I'm gonna use these for the tender uh, portion of the fire. Uh, the slightly bigger is gonna be kindling, and the thicker stuff such as this, we'll refer to that as fuel. So the basic thing is to get this small stuff off of these little limbs here, and we'll use those to get the initial fire going. Then we'll add some of the kindling on top once we get the tinder done. And then hopefully we should be able to get ourselves a nice, nice little fire going. It's gonna be interesting to see if this fire will start because most of this has been outside. It's wet. Um, We've just had some kind of weird weather over the last few weeks. Um, so we're going we're gonna to see. This could be an epic fail. Nice thin long pieces. I'll show you how we set all this up once we get it all broken out into the, into the proper piles and sizes here. Oh, that's looking very good. Very good. Take some of these other ones. I'm hoping this is dry enough that it'll actually catch fire today. If not, well, you know, epic fails happen to everybody. And if you don't think it's going to happen to you, get on out into the woods. And sure enough, sooner or later, it's going to happen. So hopefully this snapping sound means that most of this is going to be dry enough for us to, to get in. I'm going to use that as kindling. I'll use these as fuel here. Again, I'm going to pick up all this really small stuff, get it set over here, because hopefully that's the, the items that will burst into flame once we get the bird's nest set up. Get it down, get it in front of this piece of, these pieces of wood here. Now some of this is, does feel a little damp yet, but hopefully because it's snapping cleanly, it's not because it's frozen. It's been 30 to, oh, I don't know, mid-20s to mid-30s for the last couple of weeks or so. Let's see, we'll get some more of that going. 
for that size. Get a few small pieces over here. Maybe some of that will go in there. Alright, that's looking good there. Again, we're getting this small, thin stuff. Hopefully this stuff will heat up and combust in short order for us. We'll put some of this in our slightly larger pile. Love this thin little stuff here. While we're doing this, we'll talk about the basic fire lay that we're going to put out here. And what we're going to end up doing is we're going to make like a little teepee. And once we get the, the bird's nest lit on fire, we'll pull this teepee stack of these types of items right over the top. Fire loves chaos, so we're not going to have to be making this extremely neat for any particular reason. Um, in fact, the more air we can get down inside of that, down to these small pieces, it'll help for the combustion aspect of it. Obviously, as it gets hotter, you know, we can add some of these other little bit bigger pieces. I think I'll put this one in the third pile here. Adjust that accordingly. Let's see if we can break some of these down a touch. That's looking good. Small little pieces like these here go in there nicely. Put some of these other ones in this other pile. If you got a few smaller branches tacked in with it, certainly isn't going to hurt anything. Again, fire likes chaos. And chaos is what we're going to create with this particular. Uh, pile of things and this will be a pretty good test after like I said a few few weeks of wet and damp and foggy and stuff it was supposed to uh, supposed to cloud up last night and during the night it was supposed to drizzle and I don't know if it did it because I was sleeping but just on the outside chance we'll see if we can get some of this stuff put together Again, we're just going to make some of these, you know, it's about right for a taffy. Maybe something like this with a lot of branches to create a little more chaos. These just have just recently fallen out of the tree, so I'm going to assume at this point that because it's out of the tree and down on the ground that I'll put those in the fuel pile. That's our intermediate pile. More small stuff here. Peel these off. We'll get this pile going. This is our fuel, which is what we'll need to continue the fire to make it a sustainable fire. What we're going to do with these is just get it going. Um, you got to build that coal base up if you're going to, you know, continue to put larger stones and, or correction, larger pieces of wood on there. Stuff that gets up to be, you know, the size of your wrist or, or even bigger than that even. Um, Maybe that one would be better served over here. So now you see the three piles. We have kindling, we have tinder, and now we've got some fuel that will go onto the fire at the very end. Again, we've got, um, we've got our big pile of, of dried grasses, which is going to become our bird's nest that's out there. Um, this is jute twine. Jute twine typically comes together in three strands, depending on the thickness of, of what you buy. They, you know, tend to be thicker, more fibers in it. And that's what we're looking for here is this fibrous material. As we're breaking this apart, kind of teasing it up. Good way to do that, shredding it, another you know, term that could be used for that. Um, so now we're just going to pull these apart, kind of get it all teased out so that it's what we're, the objective here is just a lot of surface area. The more surface area you have, the quicker that's going to heat up, the quicker it heats up, the more likely it's going to burst into flames for us. And that's, a, a well, obviously our objective is we're trying to make a fire here. So I took those three strands, and now I'm taking each one of the individual strands, and I'm just pulling it apart, teasing it up. Yes, it's a it's a tedious, methodical type process. Once you get it kind of going, you can reach in, put it all in a big pile, and really start to, to tear that apart, tear it down, break those fibers apart. 
again, our objective here is to create as much surface area as we possibly can um, so that when we put our, our uh, piece of um, char cloth in there that's got the ember going, then we'll be able to introduce airflow by blowing into the bird's nest and across that piece of char cloth that has the ember on it. It's going to hit into this. This is going to heat up, hopefully burst into flame straight away. This is going to be inside the center of our bird's nest, which we'll wrap around. And frankly, we're just going to work it around till it looks like a bird's nest. We're going to pop a little hole into it or a little divot into the center, just like a bird would. We'll put our, our teased up jute twine in there, get it all ready to go. We'll strike the flint and steel. Once we've got that going, then, you know, we'll put that right on side, uh, right on top of the jute twine, right in the center of that bird's nest. We're going to hold it up. We're going to blow into it. We're going to hold it higher than our head so that when we blow into it, heat and flame will do the same thing. They're both going to climb upward. You do not want to be over the top blowing down into it. If it bursts into flames, you don't want it coming back up over your face. So we'll hold it at least at least even with our face, if not slightly up above it. We'll blow into it. Should start to smoke. As soon as it starts to smoke, it's going to burst into flame. We're going to take it. We're going to set it down underneath of our of our pile of chaotic small tinder here, and we're just going to pull that over the top, and then we're going to let it catch fire. As that starts to engulf and go into flames, the flames are starting to leap up out of the pile, up through the top. Then we'll start to add some of the uh, kindling into the fire. Once that starts to engage, then we'll go ahead and bring in our fuel sources, our larger, heavier pieces of wood. Now these are all damp, but fortunately the bark's starting to peel off some of that. So I'm hoping this is going to work as advertised. Now we'll go over to the um, fire pit that I've got in the backyard. And guys, understand one thing, gals too. You know, you don't have to go out into the woods. You don't have to go out to Timbuktu to practice these skills. I'm practicing them in my backyard. I can, I can go out into the woods and do this at any time. But right now I'm just doing it in the, in, the, in the sanctuary, if you will, of my backyard. I'm getting the practice in, I'm developing the skill set so that when I get out into the woods or if I find myself in a survival situation, I don't have to think about it. It's going to become second nature. Why not practice these things in a controlled, safe environment? Get your skill set, you know, get the basics down. Get it to the where it's not even a thought process. You know and understand what you have to do. Once you get to that level, kids, you can go anywhere, anytime and build yourself a fire and frankly if you're out there and it's a survival situation you don't want to be wondering what to do you want it to be a reflex action and you want to be able to handle you know getting a fire started and straight away so anyway i'll step away from this we'll go over there and we'll show you how to set everything up all right guys now you'll see down inside the fire pit, um, I've got my uh, bird's nest material. I've got my fuel leaned up against the side. I've got the kindling, or correction, the tinder. And then on the far side, I've got the kindling. You'll notice right in the middle, I've got a couple pieces of bark with the bark side up. The reason I've done this is because down inside the fire pit, it's still wet and very damp from the weather that we've had over the last couple of weeks or so. So what I needed to do was I needed to put um, basically a dry layer down so that when I build the fire on top of it, um, the moisture doesn't wick up and put out the fire. So I peeled a couple pieces of bark off of some wood from my wood pile, laid it down there so that we could shore up and have a decent um, uh, place in which we can start our process. So with that being said, now what I'm gonna do so I'm going to move my bird's nest out of the way. My piece of jute twine that we've got all teased up here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this big pile of twigs here and I'm going to try to make a basic teepee. And it's just not going to be anything spectacular. It doesn't have to be perfect by any means. 
I'm gonna make break that stick down a little bit and put it in here just to kind of hold the whole shooting match up. What I'm doing now is I'm just putting a little area down inside that's open because when I get ready to, I'm gonna put my um, I'm gonna put my bird's nest in there, and then I'm gonna pull this right over the top, and hopefully it'll start that fire. So what I've done is I've created a little <laughs> created a thing that wants to fall over. So I'm just gonna use this one stick to kind of hold, prop everything up, and then right down here in the center. Pull out a couple of these just for grins. Put them back over the top. So now what I can do is just kind of stack that, hold that up a little bit. I'll take that bird's nest, make it round. I'm gonna shove it right in underneath. And when I put it underneath, I'm just gonna pull this entire pile over the top and see if we can get that going. Now I'll build it up a little bit. Hopefully without knocking everything down. And we'll just sit there. Right towards the top there. So, as you can see, it's just a quasi teepee type thing. Uh, get all these loose ones here because I have the benefit of doing this in the backyard. And we'll just get it all ready to roll here. Now, the bird's nest. I'm just going to take this and I'm going to start working it around in a circle. And I'm just going to keep working it, working it, giving off a little extra. That's probably pretty good right there like that. I can put a little divot in the center. And I'm just pushing that down with my thumb right there in the middle. Maybe a little closer to the bottom, give plenty of that room to, to take off and fire up. And then right in the center of that, I'm going to work in that, that um, jute twine that we broke down. Now I can always take some of this, put this right over it in the top. You can still see the jute twine down inside. So now... I'll grab the flint steel. So we'll get the get the Altoids tin out. Put that rubber band in my pocket so I don't lose it. Down in the bottom here. I've got a good, good piece of char cloth in there. Set that off to the side. Get out the flint and steel. One of my favorite, absolute favorite ways to start a fire. All right, so we got that off to the side. Now we're just gonna fold this up into a nice little square. That will help us hold and maintain the spark. Because I am going to be playing with fire. I'm going to put my gloves back on. Find a nice little ridge. I'm going to put that char cloth right up on the edge there. I'm going to hold that down with my thumb. I'm going to take the flint and steel. And I'm going to strike that. Instantly, I've got an ember going in there. So I've got a second. Now I can push that down inside our bird's nest. Hold it above my head. Now we got a good fire going. All I've got to do now is kind of invert it so that it'll feed into itself. Kind of pick my pile up. I'm going to throw that in. Pull out my little stick that was holding it all up. 
And now I'm just going to wait. What I've got to do is I've got to let that fire burn. It's got to get hot. It's mucking right in my face. This is the part that most people fail at because now they've got it all set up. They see a little bit of flame down in there and then they're just so anxious to put all of this big stuff over the top. And in reality, what you end up doing is smothering your fire until these flames are fully engaged and leaping up out of the top of this initial tender lay, you would only be defeating your purpose by putting more fuel on it. Because in essence, you're gonna slow down the amount of oxygen that's going into it. Now that's going along, we're getting good oxygen because we've got a bit of a breeze out here. Now you can start to see where it's leaping up through the flames. So I'm gonna start putting some of these smaller pieces of our kindling pile in here. I like to put a few in there vertically because then it catches, the flame goes up the top, follows it along. I'll move that out of the way so you can see. Maybe a few like so. starting to get a decent fire going. Again, I'm just kind of sticking logs in here. I'm going to continue with that TP style just so that, again, it's just kind of chaotic. Fire tends to like chaos. I may have put too much there and kind of smothered it a bit, so I'm just going to bust it back open. If you can hear the moisture coming out of that, but I can. Again, I've got a few smaller pieces in my kindling pile, so I'm going to add those in. Again, just kind of however, haphazardly, tends to work pretty good. If you can get the smaller ones in, you're in like flint. Darn fine, folks. We'll give that a minute to really get going here. I need to step out of that smoke. But that's how we get that fire started by using a flint and steel, a bird's nest, with, like I said, just a, maybe a four inch piece of jute wine fluffed up. Really caught that spark nicely. Really got things moving along. And now basically we have a sustainable fire. Throw some more of this on. Again, this is the part where people usually run into problems and end up failing, they get in too big a hurry. You cannot be in a big hurry when you're feeding this part of the, the fire. You've got to let it catch on. You've got to let it get hot enough to burn things. And let's say we're doing a pretty far, fair job of that currently. Let's put one in the middle. Let's see what happens with this. Sometimes even I have to tell myself, just be patient. Let the fire do the work. There's no reason for you to be out there making it do that. The only other thing is on a no wind day, you might have to take your hat and down like so, fan it a little bit. I've had to do that a couple of times, just depending on you know the dryness of the material and how, how hot a fire you're trying to get going. But now, as you can see, appears to be a fully engaged flame. Again, we're just randomly throwing those on, somewhat in the fashion of a teepee. And now, 
from here, we can start to put a few of our, what I would consider to be pieces of fuel on here. A little bit larger, the size of your thumb. Tends to work pretty good. And again, I'm not trying to smother the fire. I'm not laying them down on top. I'm just gonna let the flame climb up through those. And I believe it will do that at, yeah, at this point. Perfect. <laughs> Burn some of the hair off my arm. That's good. <coughs> So while I'm waiting for that to fully engage, then as any good camper should do, I'll put my equipment away, I'll stow it back into my kit, that kit would go right immediately back onto my kit, put my ranger band on my Altoids 10. Holds the lid shut beautifully. Well kids, that's how we start a fire. Flint and steel, bird's nest. Now you're asking yourself, where do I find bird's nest material? Well, tell you what, let me grab the camera and I'll show you a couple of good spots for that. All right, number one, there's a leaf pile right here, dead leaves. Absolutely perfect for trying to find yourself a um, a great way to start a bird's nest. You could skin that dog alive over there and use him as a bird's nest too. Um, I only say that because he barks a lot. Now if you'll notice, and I'll zoom out there, there's a dead pile of leaves and trees and brush that's out there. You could have taken it from that hedgerow over there. Lots of dead leaves, lots of brittle you know, the stuff on the end would start a fire good. Obviously, the closer to the trunk of it, um, the less, the it, the more green it would be, the less of a fire starter. But that big pile of stuff's been yellow and brown for a couple of months. I mean, here it is the, I think today is the 13th of December and the grass is still green. The neighbor has that decorative wild grass or prairie grass or whatever you call that. Um, in fact, here in the next week or so, I've gotten permission from him. I'm going to go cut down several strands of that, and I'm going to put it into the garage and, and keep it handy. You know, got hosta plants. All these plants back here that are yellow and dried out make great fire starters. The stalks from the cornfields, um, that works great. I've got a wildlife refuge area out back there. I can pull all kinds of stuff out of there. That's a big brush pile. Um, I keep that for two reasons. One, um, because I pick it up and throw it out there from all the trees from around us. But also, that's another kindling and fire starting pile. All along the side here, we've got these uprights. Let me zoom back back here. These are hosta plants that have the flowering buds on them. I could cut all those down and take them and turn it into a bird's nest. There's plenty of dried leaves here. Really, anywhere that you find a deadfall or a dead plant or something. Again, there's those with that wild grass or the decorative grass, prairie grass, whatever it's called. I mean, if you think about it, even over in the other corner of our yard, um, especially under the bird feeder, we get all manner of weird plants over there. Um, and around the bird bath, but every one of those could be cut down and used into a bird's nest. Uh, you know, the possibilities are just endless. My wife plants all these, I um, can't remember what, what the plant's called, uh, but there are the purple and blue and white colored flowering plants. These are all dead. I'd trim every one of those down and keep that stuff for next year or for my next fire, whatever the case may be. 
So anyway, that's just where we see it. That's where we find it. Once we've got everything put together, this is how we create our fire. And as you can see, you know, we haven't done anything. We haven't fiddled around with that fire other than when we first lit it up. And, you know, it's looking pretty darn good. That That's a sustainable fire. And by that, I mean that we can put, you know, we can put more wood on that fire. We can do anything. We can bring the corners that are not burnt or the edge pieces that are not burnt yet, put it back in there. I could take some of the damp wood from my um, wood pile that's in there, start putting it on there. At this point in time, we just have a fire. We can cook, we can, you know, disinfect water. We can stay warm in the winter time. But anyway, that's how we get it done. And this is the end result. Thanks for watching guys. Uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave some comments. You know, we all learn from one another. It's been great fun. It's been a lot of fun today. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.